Welcome uh, everyone uh, on this very sunny day. Um, I guess uh, uh, we are all here uh, to celebrate uh, Pierre's uh, defense uh, and uh, sort of uh, forecasted already the outcome because uh, there will be a celebration later this afternoon. <laughs> but we're not supposed to say that. Um, so Pierre, uh, when he came to work with me, um, he was mostly, he was interested in uh, potentially two things, and I usually give a lot of freedom to my students, and uh, I let them select the topic, and I offer them a menu, just like going to a restaurant, you are offered a variety of options, and he at first chose a project on the epoch of Koreanization, uh, which as you know is uh, maturing gradually, there was a nature paper arguing that we detected, 21 centimeter signal, and that actually was the time that uh, Pierre explored in his first project. But then he realized that perhaps there is a more exciting topic, and that's uh, exploring space time uh, near black holes. Now, his intuition is obviously correct because LIGO uh, got the Nobel Prize uh, in 2017, and uh, even though many people, have, uh, a couple of years before that, when Pierre started his work, thought the uh, this is not a very promising uh, frontier. And even if we detect something, it would be very difficult to uh, figure out what it is because it would be low signal to noise. But as we all know, that's uh, a great success story. It's a miracle, I call it. Uh, LIGO is a miracle in two ways. One is politically, um, the fact that the uh, NSF, a federal organization, supported it uh, out of taxpayers' money at a billion dollars. That's remarkable. I, I, still have a very hard time understanding the intricacies because a lot of astronomers objected to that uh, project early on. They thought that the money would be taken out of the sun. So it was a miracle politically, but also scientifically because uh, nature was so kind to give us uh, events like that. But Pierre forecasted that <laughs> and uh, decided to work on, on space-time. Uh, and just to illustrate uh, his fascination with Time, I should mention that an anecdote. Uh, yesterday I met his parents sitting right here uh, for the first time and uh, I asked them about the, the jet lag. Uh, they came all the way from the other side of the globe. And uh, uh, then we got into a discussion where Pierre pointed out that when you travel on an airplane you actually are gaining a little time because you're a bit younger than you would have been if you were at rest. <laughs> So it's good for them to travel because they are aging more slowly. Uh, but of course the effect is... But then his mother, who is uh, in the medical uh, profession, she asked, uh, but when I look at the pilots, they look older than they should. <laughs> <laughs> so that's an argument against special relativity. <laughs> um, but uh, Pierre, in general, is fascinated with space time. And what he worked on are various aspects of that. Um, so. Uh, the place where space-time is most curved is around black holes, and that's uh, the topic of his uh, thesis. He will describe to us uh, aspects of black holes. Um, and by now there is uh, uh, the Black Hole Initiative nearby that Pierre plays a very important role in. Um, and uh, the other places where space-time is interesting is, for example, if you have uh, a spacecraft moving very fast, uh, you may ask, okay, suppose you take a photo of, of something, as, of a star as you pass by, the star has a circular image in the rest frame, but then if you move very fast, how would this image look like? And Pierre was curious about this question. So he wrote the, a paper where he uh, showed, uh, I mean, it was already known that when you move relative to a source, the image will remain circular. That's, that's quite remarkable. Despite Lorentz contraction, uh, it remains circular. One way to think about it is that the speed of light is the same in all frames, so, so something circular remains circular. But it, uh, it actually gets tilted a little bit. Uh, but we are one beyond that and imagine an interferometer on the spacecraft, uh, and then one can show that actually there are special relativistic effects that show up. Uh, in addition to the uh, tilt in the image. So the reason that Pierre uh, thought about that is because he's part of the 
of the group that works on, on Starshot, which is a, a very ambitious project to launch a spacecraft close to the speed of light. So perhaps one day his parents yeah. would be able to <laughs> witness firsthand uh, that they are aging more slowly than <laughs> their neighbors after they come back. Um, but the, in his uh, thesis, Pierre mostly focused on black holes and uh, the motion of gas and, and sources of light around black gas and stars. And uh, he will tell us more about it uh, next. I should also mention that Pierre is an excellent uh, teacher, and he got uh, extremely high grades from students uh, in all the classes where he, he taught. So all, all around, uh, Pierre is loved by everyone that, <laughs> that knows him. Thank you for the kind introduction, Ali. Uh, so I'm going to talk about my thesis, Nova Astrophysical Constraints on Black Holes, but I was told that in these public talks, the first thing you have to do is talk about acknowledgments. So the first person that I would like to acknowledge is my advisor, Avi Lowe. This is me and Avi six years ago. Uh, we are playing soccer. It was the ITC annual soccer game, the only one that I've attended to, and I've won, actually. But I've only won because the faculty didn't have enough players, and I joined the faculty team. <laughs> okay? If you time evolve this picture, is for six years, this is what we look like now. Uh, you can see there are various changes, right? Uh, I can give you a hint of what the changes are in this equation. Del mu t mu nu equals zero, what does this mean? This means that uh, in a stationary space-time, you can define a mass conservation law. Okay, so he lost weight, but I gained weight. Uh, and I want to mention just two things that I think I learned the most from Avi, which is the first one is to question everything. Even though, you know, like it might be, you know, like it might, the canon knowledge might already, already be set, you need to always question things by yourself and figure it out yourself. And the second is to stand up for yourself if you know something is right, even though everyone else says, you know, like you are wrong, you should be able to be, you know, like stand upon your own, uh, uh, what you believe is true. And uh, when I first joined the department, I don't know what, to work on. Like, I just came in, I just thought, like, oh, I, I want to work on theoretical astrophysics, but I'm not exactly sure what topic. And uh, an, I talked to an older student, and she said, oh, just work with Avi, he works on everything. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Avi, for uh, being my advisor this six years. Uh, I would like to also thank my dissertation committee, the chair, uh, Josh Greenley, Chef Dolman, who unfortunately cannot make it to the public talk, but will join us at the, uh, in the private talk. Mark Reed, over there. Uh, all the way, an artist tra track from MIT, my external committee, Salvo Vitale. And uh, Ramesh Narayan, who unfor unfortunately is not here right now because he's in his sabbatical. I tried to get an action shot of everyone where they look as if they're explaining something. Except Mark, he did not have a good action shot. So you can, that's all you get. OK, and I would like to thank. Uh, this department for truly being a wonderful department, and uh, I've had many friends, and you know, like uh, this, it's a it's a very de welcoming department, and most of it is because of the of the friends, you know, of the people that's in this department. And the good thing of being five foot five is you always stand in front and do, <laughs> do photos. Uh, and of course, the department will not work if you do not have the uh, tireless working of the admins. These are just photos I snapped yesterday. These are not all of the admins, but these are like some of the, uh, the people that I interact the most. Rob Scholten, he was eating at this point, and I just barged into his office to take this picture. But that kind of like exemplifies like, you know, like he's a person that you can just like come to his office at any time, you know, to ask questions, you have problems with something. Nina Zonneville, uh, she's standing right there. So, uh, I've, I've, I've organized Avi's pizza lunch for four years, and Nina and I bonded over pizza orders not coming in properly. <laughs> and Peg refuses to, for me to take pictures of it, but she has a giant peg in her office, and she said, you can take pictures of that. <laughs> so I guess it's a, yeah. OK, and also uh, to the entire family of the Institute of Theory and Computation, this institute is wonderful, and I know, like you know, like many wonderful postdocs, and it's it generates a lot of uh, ideas and collaborations, 
and also sandwiches on Thursdays. And of course, uh, my friends, fellow grad students, especially the incoming class of 2012, this is us after taking the shoe exam, which is why we are all holding Carolyn and Osley. And of all these, you know, like of all these friends, you know, like we do a lot of fun things together. Here are just a few things that we do. You know, we play music. Some of us think that grad school is not difficult enough, so we decided to find the most life-threatening creature <laughs> that you can possibly find and just, you know, like just hang out with them. Uh, Wait until you know, <laughs> 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 yeah, maybe I'll find something more threatening. And some of these come all the way, you know, like uh, Phil and Zach come all the way from Princeton to attend here, so thank you for that. Uh, especially, I, I want to point out that Phil, he was my uh, classmate for five years. We are housemates for four years, and now we collaborate, we, we publish a paper together, so, uh, because what are friends for? <laughs> and of course, my family. Uh, th this is my family without me during Chinese New Year last year, I think. Uh, they, they really like made me into who I am, and I owe, owe them everything. Uh, my parents are the first people with PhDs that I know, I know of, and that's actu that actually makes me, you know, like, through their action, it actually leads me to realize that you can just keep going to school and not take a job. <laughs> so I am, where, I am you know, it's my great pleasure and honor to walk in their shoes, literally, because I don't own formal shoes. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and of course, if I mention my family, I have to also mention the two things that I love very dearly, which are my, <laughs> my, my dogs. Okay, so uh, that's it. Let's begin on the actual science part of the thesis. That's all the jokes you're going to get from me. It's all very dry from here. Uh, <laughs> one thing to note is that when they say that I should prepare a public talk, I take this literally, and so the level of this talk would be you know, pretty low. In fact, I write this so that my parents can understand <laughs> if they see it twice. <laughs> so... Uh, just, if you work on black holes and gravitational waves, you might be, you might be bored by it, but I'm just giving you a warning because it's, it's supposed to be for a public audience. Uh, there are no equations at all in contrast to my private defense. I'm sorry to say, there's probably like a hundred equations in there. <laughs> so, okay, so let's begin. What I'm going to talk about today, I will present four things. The first one is just a background introduction of what are black holes. The second thing, black holes and their environments. The third thing, black holes as laboratories for strong gravity. And the fourth thing, black holes and gravitational waves. So, what are black holes? Our current theory of gravity is what is known as general relativity. It's proposed by Albert Einstein, and the main thing that you need to take uh, into account here is in general relativity, even light is affected by gravity. And light, as you know it, is the fastest thing that we, can, that we have. Nothing can travel faster than light. So, in general relativity, even something like this is affected by gravity. Now, if I throw a ball from the surface of a planet, okay, a ball goes up, it will go down. The ball is trapped because of gravity. Therefore, it is natural to ask the question, if light is affected by gravity, can there be objects where light also fall back down due to gravity, the same way as the ball did? So in this way, this light is trapped. This, is, this object, such an object, is what we call black hole. It is a region of such strong gravity that even light cannot escape it, okay? Now, what such objects are black holes? Here's the way you think about it. The denser something is, the more gravity it produces, okay? So imagine, okay, there's a few people who does exoplanet here, and they will probably object with the way I use the word dense. That's why it has a quotation mark. Density here just means mass over volume, okay? Average density. So the denser a planet is, the stronger the gravity, okay? If a planet is more massive, it has more gravity. If it's smaller, it also has more gravity. So therefore, the object that can trap light must be extremely, extremely dense. So the point at the center here is what we call a singularity. This is a point of infinite density, okay? This point of infinite density and density I put in quotation because it's not really the density of matter, but really the density of curvature of space-time. But uh, this region, the singularity, is enclosed within a spherical shell that we call the event horizon. This is a boundary where nothing can escape, not even light. 
So the idea is, if you are over here inside what we call the black hole interior, you cannot get out. Okay, even if you can move to the speed of light, you cannot get out. This is what we call a black hole. A black hole is not just the singularity, not just this point of infinite density, but this point of infinite density plus this event horizon. This is what we call a black hole. To get a better understanding of black hole, of black holes, consider the following picture. Say that I'm standing on a flat plane, there's something like this, and I shoot two beams of light going opposite direction at the same time, one going this way, they're going that way. Now, while we, uh, in, you know, like in everyday life, we might think that light goes in instantaneously, it actually has a propagation speed. It has a finite speed, and it moves at the speed of light, and it takes some time for it to travel some distance. Okay? Now, the y-axis here is time. Well, what do I mean by that? It means that, for example, if I shoot the beam today, tomorrow, the beam of light would have moved at the speed of light away from me, so it moves there's some distance that it travels. I do not move in space, in position. I just move in time because for that entire day, I just stand on that flat plane. Okay? You can keep going and populate this diagram, and then you can draw lines connecting these beams. Okay? Because nothing can travel faster than light, which is a postulate of relativity, I can only move within these lines. Okay, does that make sense? Because if I am to move outside of this line, I need to run faster than light. Everything, in other words, everything that I can affect is actually within these lines. That's why this, uh, the region inside this line is called the causal cone. In particular, this line is called the causal future. I can make the exact cone that goes down, it's called the causal past, and everything else outside is called my favorite technical word in physics, the elsewhere. <laughs> okay, so let's review. Nothing can faster than light. However, I can move, right? I can just not stand in this plane. I can move within this day and that day, but I can only be inside this cone. So I can move here. I can move here. Can I move here? No. No, I cannot move here because to do so, I need to travel faster than light, okay? There is, remember, in this situation, there is no black hole yet in this picture. I am trapped within these lines, not because there is a black hole, but because I cannot move faster than light. Okay? This is just a fact of life. Accept it. <laughs> right. So, let's do the same picture near a black hole. Let's put the singularity, this point of infinite density here. And now, this distance here, remember, this is still time. This is distance. This is distance away from the singularity. So if the singularity is here, this distance just gives you a measurement here. It's like away from it. The singularity does not move. The same way as I do not move uh, in when I'm standing on that flat plane, so it just goes up in time like this. Right? Remember? Because like when I didn't move in that plane, I just go up in time like that. Far from the singularity, in other words, far from the black hole, my causal cone, this cone, looks the same as before. In general relativity, again, light is affected by gravity. Therefore, remember, this cone is just defined by me shooting beams of light to my left and to my right. The lines defining my future begins to tip. Just because in general relativity, relativity light is affected by gravity, and this light beam is attracted to this singularity, to this point of infinite density. So it begins to tip. As I get closer and closer, it keeps tipping. Now, I'm sure you are grant me that at some point it's going to tip so much that, remember, I can only move. I can only move within these lines. There is no way for me to move away from the singularity. Okay? There's no way for me to move away from this line. This is called an event horizon. Once here, I cannot move away from the singularity. Okay? This is what an, uh, an event horizon is. Uh, you might saw a different presentation of how black hole works in your physics classes using Newtonian mechanics. It's complete garbage. <laughs> this is fully general relativistic, and in my opinion, an easier way to think about black holes. Uh, here's another, another cool, cool fact. Once you're inside here, right, even if you are a little bit in, 
this is going to bend even more so that the singularity is always in my future. Okay? There is no way for me to move away such that I do not hit the singularity at some point in my future. Even if I have an infinitely powerful rocket that can accelerate me to the speed of light, I will still hit the singularity. Okay? This is what we meant uh, by saying that for this, these types of black holes, the singularity is not a point in space, but rather a moment in time. Indeed, in a technical sense, within the event horizon, time and space switches places. Okay? And these are all for non-rotating black holes. Once you're rotating, oh, man. You think you've seen, you know, you haven't seen anything. <laughs> yeah, once you rotate things, it becomes extremely, extremely, you know, like, uh, way more complicated. Okay, anyway, so, this is what an event horizon is. Now, distance away from the singularity, it's just like one line, right? But the singularity exists in three-dimensional space, so this distance should go around, okay, in all direction. That's why this distance away from the singularity, say it's here, it's actually like also there, it's also there, it's also there, it's also into the board, out of the board. And this line, this line here, remember this, this line here, this event horizon, is actually a sphere. It describes a sphere. In uh, astronomy, we often don't care what's inside the event horizon because nothing can get out. So, because of this, we often block it out. We just say a black hole is just something that looks like this. Something completely dark. Now, if not even light can escape a black hole, how can we see them? While a black hole is invisible, the region around it is actually bright. This is because gas particles speeds up as they get sucked into the black hole, and these gas particles interact with each other through friction, essentially. Okay? Friction heats things. If you rub your hands together, friction causes your hands to be warm. Now, try rubbing your hands together at about the speed of light. Your hand will become so hot that it will just uh, turn into a bright ionized plasma. Okay? Indeed, these gas particles around a black hole is bright, hot plasma, like the sun. The sun is an example of a plasma. And it forms what is called the accretion disk. Okay? This accretion disk is a disk that the black hole is embedded inside. And this accretion disk is bright. And when we say a telescope sees a black hole, usually what we mean is this. See the accretion disk? I mean, also things like jets, and, but don't worry about that. But it's mostly like, you know, like bright things around the, uh, the black hole, not the black hole itself. Okay, how do black holes form? So yesterday, we had a talk by Fernando Becerra for his dissertation, and he talks about how black holes can form directly through collapse of gas. Here is another way you can form black holes that is much less massive. You start with a massive star that is many, many times more massive than the sun. At the center of that star is a core, a dense core. Gravity wants to squish things together and wants to squish the core down, compactify it. However, the core has pressure and it contracts gravity. That's why it's like in somewhat of a balance. Gravity, however, is stronger if the core is more massive. If the core is too massive, gravity will win, and the core will contract. In fact, it will keep on contracting into a singularity, and then a black hole is born. Remember, a singularity, once you have a singularity, you have all these, like, structure that gives you the event horizon, and then you have a black hole. All right, so let's talk now about black holes and their environment. Black holes do not live in vacuo. Black holes uh, interact with their surroundings, and their surroundings feeds back to them. In this part of my thesis, uh, what we are trying to consider is, are there ways to astrophysically probe how a black hole and its surrounding interacts with each other? So there is a, a giant black hole at the center of our Milky Way galaxy. It's called Sagittarius A star. It's a supermassive black hole. It's, the size is about four times. Four million times the mass of the sun. So really, really, really big, really massive. It is surrounded by a cluster of stars. This region is teeming in stars, and these stars are gravitationally tugged by both the supermassive black hole and also by each other. Suppose we ask if some of these stars are pulsars. Okay, what are pulsars? Pulsars are the best natural clocks in the universe. They are spinning, uh, they are spinning 
neutron stars. There are, you can think about it as like a dense compactified star that spins around its axis, but it beams in the preferred collimated direction and it goes around like a lighthouse. Okay, that's what a pulsar is. The rotation rate of a pulsar is measurable, number one. Number two, it's very, very precise. And it, it's, it could be huge. It could be as large as 1,000 times per second. Okay? In fact, after I finish this sentence, one of these might have already rot rotated you know, 10,000 times. Okay? These are what pulsars are. Now, the point is that it's the rotation rate here, you can measure it through from telescopes on Earth. However, there is this, there's this idea called the Doppler shift. And to summarize, to sum summarize it, the clock of this pulsar, the regularity of this rotation, can be spoiled by being tugged gravitationally. OK, so the black hole here affects surrounding pulsars in the following way. The first, the black hole tugs the pulsar directly through its gravity. The second, the black hole tugs stars, other stars via its gravity, and the star tugs the pulsars. So it's kind of like a, you know, like a, uh, it's kind of like an indirect way of affecting this pulsar. And the effect on the rotation rate of the pulsar in the period can be measured. And this is uh, a plot that we wrote for a, we made for a paper. So the x-axis here is the velocity of pulsar, and the y-axis here is the mass of not only the black hole actually, but also like all the stars around it. So the idea is. These lines, they just come from considering uh, how much these pulsars are tugged, the rotational period, okay, or uh, the rate of changes of the rotational periods. And they form constraints, and we found that the combinations of mass and velocity can only be the ones that are uh, intersected by these lines. Okay, so this is our first constraint of black holes. And I want to say something about this, this paper, because this paper is my first paper with Avi that we published on uh, black holes and compact objects. It's not my first paper. My first paper is on 21 centimeter cosmology. And uh, it's, it's to his credit that he allows me to switch, because I, I was, I was it's, there's nothing wrong with the 21 centimeter view. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, I, I was just not, my heart was not in it. And I do know a lot of graduate students who got stuck with a project, and their advisors do not let them to change. So thank you, Avi, for allowing me to, to switch to a project, project that better suits me. OK, so what else could be around uh, black holes? You have these stars. Suppose there is also a neutral hydrogen disk. This is a disk of cold gas around the black hole. This disk, I, I just remove the stars because you know, they don't do anything in this picture. It's just cluttering. This disk is not the accretion disk. This is. This, this is much bigger than the accretion disk and much colder. So the accretion disk might be like, you know, somewhere like close by. So this is the disk from the top view. That's why it's called a disk. Okay, you just have black hole in this and you have black hole in the middle. Now, the question we ask is, can we detect such a disk if such a disk exists? Okay? Now, black hole, like I said, is surrounded by hot plasma and hot plasma radiates. Think of the surface of the sun. The surface of the sun is a, is a hot plasma, and we have what's called the photosphere, which is the part of the sun that's bright. Similarly, around a black hole, the hot plasma also creates a photosphere. Light from the photosphere can be observed on Earth, but if such a neutral hydrogen disk exists, some light will be blocked by it. So we compute the amount of light that is blocked by the disk, so here, the x-axis, the x-axis here is spectrum. Don't worry about it if you don't know what spectrums are. The y-axis is just the amount of radiation that is being blocked. So if there is no disk, it should be zero. But if there is such a disk, depending on the size of the disk and the inclination of the disk, you can get different amount of uh, absorption. Indeed, we also ask the question, what happens if the disks have some gaps in them, which could be produced dynamically. And you can form, you can make the same plot. You know, you can ask like if you have a gap disk, the size of the gap, the amount of the gap, what will what will the absorption looks like? Right. Okay. Now let us now zoom in close to a black hole, much closer than those cluster of stars. Again, this black hole is surrounded by hot plasma, which 
is very hot because of friction. Hot plasma is unstable. By this I mean hot plasma tends to launch things. It tends to just release, energetically release. It just releases energy. For example, uh, the sun is a, is a hot plasma, and the sun periodically releases solar flares, uh, and they periodically ejects hot plasma blobs called coronal mass ejections. Mm -hmm. And we suppose that such, an, uh, such a process can also happen close to a black hole. So black holes, or rather, outside of it, the, the hot plasma around it, will produce these blobs, and it will be launched. And we ask the question, what can be learned about black holes by measuring or monitoring the trajectory and expansion of these blobs? All right? In particular, we want to see if you can back out the black hole space-time, which is the parameters of black hole, say the mass of the black hole, things like that, by monitoring how fast this blob moves and uh, how, how, how much it stretches. So let me go into more details with this. The trajectory seems uh, pretty obvious. If you have blobs that are launched, the same blobs that are launched from two different black holes, one of them is small and the other is large, you would think that the larger black holes will launch slower blobs. This is the same idea that bigger black hole means stronger gravity, and you can throw a ball faster on the moon than on Earth. Okay? So by measuring the trajectory, you can get a measure of like how massive the blob is. This is very obvious, I think. However, there's a complication, and that is black hole spins. Much like a top, a black hole can also spin. And when it spins, the entire space-time spins along with it. So, remember, gravity, you might be used to think of gravity as something that sucks in, but gravity around a spinning black hole, in addition to sucking things, also forces you to spin along with the black hole. Okay, so if I have a ball, or let's say a plasma blob, close to a spinning black hole, the gravity around it not only causes it to be pulled, it also forces it to spin. So this trajectory that's really nice and straight really should look like this. It should bend. So this is the calculation that we did. This is time. The y-axis is time. The x-axis is r. You might be used to thinking about time being in the x-axis, but then just tilt your head, OK? It's the same thing. This is uh, distance, and what we calculate in this paper is actually the projected distance that can be measured by telescopes such as the Event Horizon Telescope. The projected distance of these blobs as it moves, if, it's, uh, if, it, if the black hole has a lot of rotation, this dashed line, or a black hole that, is, that doesn't have any rotation, which is this solid line. The difference is slight, but you can see that in general, black hole that is spinning rapidly uh, launches, uh, launches faster blobs. Okay? Now, the expansion. This blob is stretched by the gravity of the black hole as it moves. I mean, it might also have an inherent expansion, but it will also be stretched. Okay? So, let me sh give us a short review, a short course on like how tidal expansions work. Gravity is stronger the closer you are to the black hole. Okay? That makes sense because we are not affected by, you know, we are not being pulled by black some black hole because black hole is really far away. That's a questionable statement. Uh, so this side of this plasma blob is closer to the black hole than that side. So one side is being pulled more by gravity than the other side. Because of this differential difference, this blob is going to be stretched. Okay. In general relativity, the stretching is proportional to this quantity that's known as the Riemann tensor. Uh, it's just a quantity. Don't worry about what it actually means. But the point is the Riemann tensor depends on black hole space-time parameters. It depends on the mass of black hole. depends on the spin of a black hole. If you go beyond general relativity, it will depend on other uh, parameters that you put into your black hole. So by monitoring the stretching, we can monitor the Riemann tensor which allows us to monitor the black hole parameters. OK? By the way, this stretching idea is almost the reason we get tides on Earth. Okay, It's kind of like maybe like 70% of the reason. The other reason is hydrodynamics. Uh, OK, so you have this, uh, this picture of this, this black hole that's launching blobs, and this blob is getting stretched. This is a calculation that we did. 
the y-axis here is the difference between, uh, it's kind of the amount of stretchiness. You know, uh, the higher it is, the more stretched the, the, the blob is. X here is radius away from the blob. Uh, sorry, from the black hole. The solid line here is a non-spinning black hole, and it progressively becomes more and more spinny. Okay? So the idea is that you can probe how, how, how spinny, how much spinning, how much spin the, blo uh, the uh, black hole has by monitoring these, these plasma blobs. By the way, all my units are, you know, R, this, this is units of mass. Don't worry about it, okay? Uh, in this field, it's typically common to measure lengths with masses. It's just the way it is. Uh, okay, the next part I'm going to talk about is black holes as laboratories of strong gravity. What, is it, what do I mean by that? It means, let's check whether Einstein was right. Okay? The question we are trying to ask is whether general relativity is correct. Black holes in general relativity is modeled by what we call the Kerr-Newman black hole. This is an absolutely wonderful object that only depends on three parameters, on three numbers. The mass of the black hole, angular momentum of the black hole, the spin, and the electromagnetic charge, which is the electric charge and the magnetic charge. But for uh, black holes in astrophysics, usually this is zero, so we don't even, so it's only two numbers. Black holes are extremely simple when people say, Black holes, oh, you, you, know, you work on black holes, it's very complicated. No. I can th imagine like systems of pulleys more complicated than this. <laughs> okay, so the question is, how do we know whether this is the right model? How do we know whether black holes in space are actually the ones prescribed by general relativity? For a lot of people, this is kind of like self-obvious. Like, it's like, oh, yeah, it has to be. But uh, this is kind of a, in a way that's like very characteristic of Avi's <laughs> of his uh, thinking, he drives me into questioning, you know, like, really, there is only one way to answer these questions, which are as astronomical observations. Astronomical observations have to be made to test this hypothesis, whether the black holes are Kerr-Newman black holes or not. In other words, here's in words, Kerr-Newman black hole is a black hole as we know it. How do we know it's not this instead? Okay? Why is this important? Why is this important to, to check whether black holes are Kerr-Newman black holes is not, or not? Of course, it's important to check whether general relativity is true or not, but there are other reasons. The kerr newman black hole is actually not derived just using general relativity. In addition, it requires the following two things to be true. One, there is no closed time-like loop. By that, I mean no time travel. Two, nature abhors singularities without event horizons. Okay? I'm going to expand on this. So, really, however, that the testing whether Kerr-Newman black holes are real or not is not only a test of relativity, but also of these like very basic, you know, philosophical principles that I think we as humans take for granted. What is no closed time-like loop? Well, what do I mean by no time travel? Remember this plot? Okay. Time goes in the y-axis. A closed time-like loop is I'm, if I'm here, I can go around this loop, go to my past and come back. If the Kerr-Newman black hole is the only black hole out there, this is no good. You can't have this, okay? Nature opposes singularities without even horizon. What does this mean? Remember, a singularity is a point of infinite density, and a black hole in a, in a special, you know, in a general relativity, relativistic ca uh, calculation argument that we made, before for non-rotating black holes, you would expect that there is some uh, event horizon that protects it. However, suppose you have just a singularity without an event horizon. This is terrible. It's bad because physics as we know it breaks down here. We don't know what to do. We cannot predict what can come out of a singularity. Anything can come out. Stars can come out. Hamburgers, okay? <laughs> Pumpkins carved. It's not even Halloween. <laughs> Completely unpredictable. And worst of all, you know, my entire thesis can come out. <laughs> uh, like, Anything can out. So singularities are terrible, but the idea is this. I mean, I'm I am uh, I'm paraphrasing a lot, but like the idea is the following: singularities are bad because the physics, as we know, it breaks down. However, if it's hidden with inside the horizon, a horizon, it's more okay because nothing can escape the event horizon. So the badness, all the badness, is imprisoned inside, and it's not allowed to spoil the rest of the universe. Okay. So can we devise astrophysical observations to test which of these are true? The Kerr-Newman black hole, or this, like, whatever. So one way we, co we consider on how to solve this problem is to compare the signals of pulsars. Remember, as before, gravitational tugging changes the pulsar signal. 
And here, this, don't worry about the axis of this plot, really. The y-axis is just the amount of modification that the signal receives if, if it's orbiting around this instead of that. If, if it's orbiting around this, a Kernium black hole, it's zero. Otherwise, it's this. This you can test if you have a pulsar around black holes. Another is if, black holes is, if a black hole is immersed in a magnetic field, we know what happens to a Kernium black hole. It will suck in the magnetic field close to the black hole. This is an easy calculation in general relativity. In fact, the hardest part about this is to draw this in PowerPoint. <laughs> now, the question is, what are magnetic fields? What do magnetic fields do around this type of black holes? So we found a solution for the magnetic field around a non-Einstein black hole. So the y-axis here is just the amount of, think of this as like the amount of deviation from an Einstein black hole. This is the radius. Closer in, there is more deviation. Okay? And it's difficult to do this test, but it's, it's in principle possible. Okay, so the fourth part is gravitational waves. Uh, so I'm going to start with an exposition on what gravitational waves is, and then we'll continue with more stuff that I do. This is, in other words, this is, uh, the subtitle is how black holes illuminate the cosmos, okay? What are gravitational waves? In general relativity, gravitational waves are ripples in space-time, okay? In words, this is the only equation in this entire presentation. In words, space-time is background space-time plus some gravitational wave. Compare this to the ocean, which is, a, you know, like an addition of calm water plus some ocean waves. Okay? Now, if you have a surface of a pond, movement causes ripples on the surface of a pond. Okay? Suppose you have rocks. You have two rocks on the surface of a pond. You rotate them around, it will generate ripples. This is the same idea in gravitational waves, but instead of rocks, I switch it to black holes. And instead of a pond, I switch it to the fabric of space-time, which permeates the universe. Okay? Note, because I need two rocks to rotate, I need binary black holes, which are two black holes orbiting around each other. These are what you need to produce uh, gravitational waves. Now you ask, why can't I generate gravitational waves with just one black hole? It's so much easier. You know, like instead of having this, in fact, you know, like I can create a ripple on a pond surface just by dropping rocks like this. Rocks goes down and then ripples comes out. Just one, one rock needed. However, here's the main difference. In a pond surface, there is no third dimension to drop rocks from. In a space time, sorry, in a pond surface, there is a third dimension that I can drop, drop rocks from. In a space time that we live in, we just live in the, the space time, there is no such extra dimension. Imagine creatures that only live on the surface of, of the pond. Analogously, we only live on the surface of a pond. For such a creature, if a black hole falls from the third dimension down, it will appear as if the black hole just appears out of thin air. Okay? So the black hole just appears out of thin air, just like, whoop. This is not good. Mass is conserved and cannot just appear out of thin air. This is why you cannot just produce it with just like one uh, body. I mean, there are other reasons also, but this is the easiest to understand. What about moving one black hole up and down, like so? Certainly, I can create ripples like that. After all, this is how we produce light. In light, which is the theory of electromagnetic waves, we have electron, and we move it up and down and produce these waves. Okay? Uh, there are some AMO people. There's a couple AMO people in the, in the audience, and they would say, like, there are other ways to produce light, but this is just, you know, I like, you know, this is the classical, I like classical physics. Okay, why can't you do this? Here's why. To move a black hole, uh, to move a black hole up, another object has to compensate for the momentum, okay? So I have to stand here with a lever and I have to physically move the black hole up and the black hole down. You have to do this. <laughs> the black hole produces this gravitational wave. I produce another gravitational waves. The combination of them exactly cancel each other out. So you don't get anything. So just believe me, the way to produce gravitational waves is you need two black holes, binary black holes rotating around each other. Okay? How can we de detect the gravitational waves? What, 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 can, uh, what can we do to see these? So imagine a ring of material. Imagine what happens to this ring if it is hit by gravitational radiation, by gravitational waves. Over time, it will stretch and squeeze. Uh, it will stretch and squish. Okay? Now, turns out there are two kinds of gravitational waves. There are two polarizations, the same way as uh, electromagnetic radiation has two polarization, the one that does this and the one that does this. This one also has two of them. 
One of them is called the plus polarization. If you get hit, you do this. This one is called the cross polarization. If you get hit, you do this. It's diagonal. OK? How can we detect these, though? Suppose we put a ruler to measure this distance. Over time, this distance will change. The measured length will change because of the passing Grafschel waves. A Grafschel observatory or a Grafschel wave telescope, in the simplest sense, you know, the simplest case, is just a ruler that measures this distance. Okay? And we did this. Uh, well, the fine people at LIGO did. <laughs> In 14 September 2015, and the first detections were awarded the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics. Why is this interesting? Previously, we detect black holes by observing the bright accretion disk. Now, not all black holes have bright accretion disk. Okay? Not all black holes have bright accretion disk. And now, we can see these invisible black holes as long as they're in binaries. We can now answer questions like this. How many binary black holes are there? How heavy are they? How are they formed? Etc. These questions before are completely you know, out of our reach. Because we can only see black holes that have accretion disks, and not all of them have them. So, okay. So the question we asked in this uh, paper is, how many binary black holes are there in the Milky Way? Now, notice the following. When binary, binary black holes emit gravitational radiation, uh, they lose energy, which makes them orbit closer and closer and closer together. The distance between them, this bar, is not a molecule. <laughs> it's a bar. It, it doesn't exist in real life. It's just a distance called the orbital separation. This is the flow of time. As time passes by, because it's emitting Grafschel radiation, it, uh, it, uh, the orbital separation decreases. Properly accounting of this effect, we found that the Milky Way is teeming with these binary black holes. Uh, in fact, our calculation shows that within the Milky Way, there are about 30,000 binary black holes with orbital separation closer than 10 solar radius, which is very close. Now you ask, if orbital separation gets smaller and smaller in time, Okay, it keeps smaller and smaller. At some point, they're going to collide. And when they collide, they merge to form a bigger black hole. Okay? If you have a cluster of these black holes, black holes then can merge multiple times, generating extremely large black holes. Suppose you have three black holes to start with. These two can merge, and then these merge to form this one. This is what we calculate for a paper that uh, I did with Avi and Philip Motz. Suppose I have this following plot. The y-axis here is just the number of black holes of that particular mass. This x-axis here is just the mass of that black hole. Suppose you start with a bunch of tiny black holes and a little bit of medium-sized black holes and basically no large black holes. These two can merge to form a bigger black hole and then merge again to form an even, you know, like to form, like to populate the medium-sized black holes. But then the medium-sized black holes can merge to form large black holes, and then you continue this process, this merging process, until you make pretty big black holes, really large black holes. This is what exactly what we found. Uh, this plot is kind of complicated, but it's actually the same thing. Okay, The y-axis here is just the number of black holes of particle mass. The x-axis here is just the mass of black holes. Okay, So this trapezoid here, this gray trapezoid here, is the initial population of black holes before any mergers. The solid blue line here is the population of mergers after 10 giga years of evolution of merging, 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 merging. And these lines in between is uh, the intervening times. So the idea is, look, in the beginning, you don't have any black hole that's really massive. After 10 giga years of all these mergings, you start to find, you start to populate these black holes. These black holes can go as high as 100 times the mass of the sun. These are what we call the seeds of intermediate mass black holes. Okay? Uh, however, also, if you, if you have too many mergers, you can produce too many massive black holes. So look here. The solid blue line here is the population of the black hole after it is merging. Uh, we expect there to still be more little black holes and not that many large black holes. If there are too many mergers, then this can flatten out. Then you have as many little black holes as big black holes. We don't really see this in real life. We don't really see this. So this leads to a constraint on the mergers and populations of black holes. In addition, you see like there's like this line has like some really interesting properties. There are these breaks, right? It bends and there's like this drop. 
we found good explanations for all of these, but I have don't have the time to go through any of it. So yeah, let's read this paper. <laughs> now, finally, uh, as the Coupe de Gras, I am going to talk about the last project that I work on. In general relativity, remember, light can be bended by gravity when passing through a massive object, because light is affected by gravity. It's the same idea if you throw a ball and the ball bends when it's passing through a massive object. Suppose you have a star and it emits radiation. If you have like a massive object here, it doesn't have to be a black hole, this light is going to be bent. This is called a lensing event, because this is very similar to how lenses bend light. In fact, these massive objects, we call the lens, the lens object. Astronomers are not very creative. Now, the details are more complicated, certainly. It always, it's always the case when you uh, take intuitions you know, for electromagnetic radiation light and apply it to gravitational waves, details are always more complicated, but the salient points are the same. The details are more complicated, but the same things happens to gravitational radiation. Gravitational radiation also get bent by these lenses, by these massive objects. The question we ask now is, can gravitational wave observatories detect these lensing events? So the, the uh, answer we found in this paper with, uh, that I wrote with uh, my external committee, Salvo Vitale and Avi Loeb, uh, is yes, the answer is yes. By the way, this paper, you know, it's the, my co-author, Salvatore Vitale, he goes by Salvo, Abraham Loeb goes by Avi, so I thought I should go by Pi, but, <laughs> but it's, it's too late by now. <laughs> so what does this plot uh, say? This plot is the y-axis here, just think about this as how good can I detect my lenses? How good can I detect these lenses? This x-axis here is the mass of the lenses. The idea is you can imagine that larger lenses are easier to detect. Okay? These three lines here are, you can think of this as the three, how bright the gravitational wave event is. The brighter your event is, this red one is the brightest, the easier can you detect lenses and you can detect lenses of smaller mass, okay? In fact, the smallest lens that is observable by current generation detectors, something like LIGO, is a few tens of solar masses. We also calculate that future detectors can see lenses as small as one solar mass. This is what we call a posterior PDF. Don't worry about it. I just show it here for people, because there's a lot of you in the audience who loves these things. <laughs> and yeah, the point is just it's consistent with um, the detection of one solar mass lenses. Okay? So let me go through my conclusion. Oh, sorry. Not, yet. <laughs> Not quite there yet. So why is this important? Why is it important that gravitational wave oscillatories can detect these lenses? And let me tell you why this is really cool, that you, if, if you can do this. These lenses can be any massive object. So this technique allows us to detect dim stars, stars that are too far away to be detected by telescope. It can detect other black holes. It can detect, I don't know, something that we have never seen before, okay? This brings this gravitational waves to more of an equal footing to electromagnetic radiation because we have been using electromagnetic radiation to uh, observe, you know, to learn about the universe and to learn about every single thing, you know, like all sorts of things. Gravitational radiation, since they need two black holes or two compact objects in general, two compact objects, to produce, you might think that they can only be used to study these compact objects. But if you can do something like this, you can like detect lenses, then you can use this to study anything that has mass, okay? This makes it like, you know, like, this allows you to apply this uh, gravitational wave to, to, you know, like, study the cosmos. And so, yeah, this is the main point. Gravitational waves are not only useful in study of black holes, but it can be used to study any lensing objects. Okay? Now, the, my conclusions. Black holes are fascinating and are still going to be fascinating for many years in the future. Okay? So this gives some job security. Questionable job <laughs> security. So black holes affect their environments, and their effects can be probed by astronomical observations. Black holes can be used as laboratories for strong gravity to test uh, uh, ideas related to strong gravity. And in particular, I want to add that this is one of very, very few ways to test these theories. Sorry. 
Finally, gravitational waves are emitted by binary black holes, and it allows us to study the, the, the uh, it allows us to study binary black holes through novel means. However, as I pointed out uh, in my last project, gravitational waves can be lens, which allows a study of the lenses themselves and also the propagation medium, the medium where the waves propagate through. This is very ironic because in this ironic way, black holes, which traps light, through their gravitational radiation, sheds light upon the cosmos. Okay, and I'll put my conclusions up here. And I want to say thank you for uh, coming and also for uh, bearing with me for six years. <laughs> thank you. Travel agency can sell you just a one-way ticket. You don't <laughs> have to it's half the price. That's right. Questions for Pierre? Angelis. I know you didn't have time to talk about it, but I'll ask you. So can you talk a little bit about the break, especially at 50 solar masses and your block for mass function? Do you want to come to our private defense? <laughs> no, do, you, do I? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, oh, okay. The break in the initial population. Well, no, I'm, well, because you go back one slide, like, earlier in time. Yeah, there. Right? Like, because you have the initial population, and then it translates into your final yeah. thing, right? So you're talking about this break here? Yeah. Ah, yeah. This break, which we call the upper mass gap, is generated by supernova theory. The idea is the following. <coughs> the progenitors, to make black holes, as I talk about, you need big stars. And big stars <laughs> needs to collapse to form black holes. However, beyond, you know, and generally, bigger stars, Generally, not always. Um, bigger stars produces bigger black holes. Beyond a certain mass of stars, when they explode, they are pair instability. Uh, they, are, they, are, they are unstable to pair instability. And so, when this happens, it's a it's a runaway explosion process that leaves no remnant, no black holes. So this happens because of, you know, like, this parent stability supernovas. If there are no parent stability supernovas, then you just keep populating this. All right. Uh, so the lenses, uh, is there something you can learn about the lenses from studying them with gravitational waves rather than with electromagnetic radiation? You have a lot of events, so you can <laughs> That's one thing. Another thing is you can learn a lot about gravitational waves, actually. Because gravitational waves and, uh, uh, Electromagnetic radiation are lens differently. Okay? Uh, one of them is lens in the wave optics regime, the other is lens in the geometric optics regime. So you can actually learn a lot about gravitational waves. Uh, the lens themselves, to this to, to the approximation that we use, are identical. However, if you uh, relax our approximations that we use, so we, we make some approximation in the Einstein's equations to that view. But if you, if you relax our approximation, we can learn uh, the lens in a different way than, than the electromagnetic waves, because they affect th things like polarization, like that, like things like that are different. Here I didn't have a chance to get into technical details, but basically the wavelength of the gravitational wave is of the order of the size of the black hole, right? And, and so that's of the order of um, the time delay in the introduced by the lens. And so you end up with just interference due to the lens. It's not really bending of that. Yeah. He didn't have but his equations will be shown at the <laughs> So I want to ask about the lensing as well. If you go to your plot about the um, the likelihood, so you mentioned that if the signal to noise ratio is higher, then the likelihood of uh, detecting this, the gravity, the lensing signal is higher. Yes. But for a given, you know, typical mass of a black hole, the higher the signal to noise, the more nearby the event is going to be, which means that the lensing probability drops down. Right. So is that factored into this? No, it's not factored in this. Are you my referee? <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the questions that the referee asked. He must have been an observer. <laughs> <laughs> like, what, what about these rates? So I don't have time to go through these, these rates, but you can make a kind of like estimates back of order of the estimate uh, computations, uh, and you will get kind of like uh, you will get about a few per year. 
essentially. You know, like a next generation. Yeah. Next generation. Next generation, yeah. Accounting these like, this type of effects that you're talking about. Go ahead. Forgive me, this may be a bit of a tangent, but I'm curious black holes do evaporate, mm -hmm. I guess, mm -hmm. and the smaller ones evaporate faster. Mm -hmm. And it seems like, you know, in some limit, they can evaporate really fast. Yep. And we know that all the dynamics is time reversible, so in some limit, you know, it's unlikely, you know, a black hole could spontaneously form by things coming together in the reverse process. So if it's fast enough, can that generate gravitational waves? Because that's almost like dropping a rock and having a black hole appear from something. So, not quite, okay, so the first thing is, uh, so there's a, there's a lot of it in that in that question. So uh, the, the 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 first the first thing is in order to produce gravitational waves, you need to change quadruples. Okay, that's like kind of the lowest order term is the quadruple. So I don't you know like if you give me a way to produce a change in quadruple, I don't care how you do it. It doesn't have to be you know Hawking radiation. It can be like anything you know like just anything. If you can produce a change in quadruple, you can produce something like this. You can produce gravitational waves. That's kind of like the, the gist of it. Okay. Uh, in terms of the reversibility of Hawking radiation, that's, I mean, there's like a lot of issues with evaporating space times. You know? uh, it's, there's a theorem. It cannot be globally hyperbolic. Uh, which maybe, I don't know. Maybe I think that's somewhat wrong. Okay. Well, yeah, the issue of the Hawking evaporation is obviously not resolved yet because uh, uh, if Hawking's calculation was correct, then uh, it would violate everything that is dear to our heart, which is predictability. Because starting from a set of initial conditions where you have some information, uh, you end up with a black hole. You, you can put the information into a black hole, and then it would evaporate, and you lose this information. That's the information paradox. It means that for an observer, after that event, that information is lost. And so it's not what we call sacred in physics, that you start from an initial condition that can forecast the future uh, using the equations that we have. That is not possible if Hawking's calculation was correct. So that's an unresolved, and, and it touches on the issue of time reversibility. And, and so we, this is an unsolved problem. And uh, I had a bet with Andy Strominger, and he um, he argued that he was he will be able to solve the information paradox before we develop the spacecraft moving uh, fraction. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah, so that's that's what I mean. I guess I'm using I don't know if I'm using like too many technical terms, but global hyperbolicity just means that uh, you know if you don't have that, then at some point determinism breaks down. Uh, I mean, black holes are, our black holes, all black holes that I consider, are all embedded inside Minkowski space. Yeah. But I also don't touch, uh, you know, like, uh, Hawking radiation, which is quantum, you know, it's more like, it's, it's, it's like, a, it's not quantum gravity, it's like a, a, a limit of like, you know, like, uh, applying quantum field theory to, to curve space time. Uh, I like classical physics. Which is up to and including general relativity. I don't like once you start putting each bars. <laughs> it ruins everything. <laughs> More questions? Yeah. Just one. Oh, yes, go ahead. That's far off. Do you expect to see any correlation or discovery of the graviton now that gravity waves have been discovered? Do you expect to see graviton? And if so, do you expect them to be at the event horizon? How, and then in follow up, how do you expect to explain the mass of a black hole in terms of Higgs boson? Of okay, so first, first thing, let, let me go through, first thing first, like a graviton, okay, depends on what you mean by graviton, okay? A graviton, the way a classical physicist, un, you know, like, talks about it, is linear, you know, like, you know, like it's uh, a linear approximation of the Einstein equation. Is this Einstein equation in the weak field limit? You know, you have your your metric, GAD, plus some H mu, which is like a small perturbation, and that H mu, that is graviton. Graviton is not like the entire, so you know, like uh, it's not the entire like space time. It's just the little wiggles, okay? Well, a black hole is like the entire. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, 
And then, of course, you might be asking about like you know like uh, more like you know like uh, the, the the particle physics aspect of it, which you know like we don't we don't have a theory of quantum gravity, so like I can't really you know answer like how how black hole works, you know like if you with a with a full theory of quantum gravity. Or you have to put an H bar into your system. <laughs> no, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely not. Yeah, I have a general question for you uh, here. So we assume that black holes exist. Yes, I <laughs> can. <laughs> thank God for that in your thesis. But what in your view generally constitute proof of the existence oh. of black holes? Okay, this is an interesting question because certainly we can always come up with models that explains all our explanation, you know, all our observations but without black holes, okay? One of the model is Gravistar, for example. So Gravita, Gravistar is a solution of Einstein equation, which is kind of like, it looks like uh, short shell outside. Inside, it's expanding. It looks like this sitter and there's like some shell connecting. Okay? These types of solutions are allowed in Einstein equation because Einstein equation actually do not describe a lot of things about like what space time is possible or not. That job is taken by the energy conditions. Okay? And the energy conditions, we kind of just believe. <laughs> we kind of just believe the energy conditions to be true. Uh, they, they seem sensible to us. And that's actually what's constraining these, you know, like what sort of objects you can, not the Einstein equations. Now, something like a gravistar or any other like things like this is cooked up by people to specifically to, you know, like agree with a lot of our observations. Like Gravistar is cooked up in such a way so that the outside looks like, you know, looks like uh, black holes. And in addition to that, uh, there are tunable parameters that you can work with. That if I show you like, oh look, the ring down from like LIGO, for example, show that it's a black hole. Right? You say like, oh, I just tuned down this parameter or I changed my parameter and my model fits also. You can't really, you know, you can't really go far enough. To, you know, to satisfy everyone, I think. So in this way, my answer is like based on motivation. I feel like something like a Gravistar is poorly motivated. So uh, that's my cup. It's not based on like kind of like a scientific cup, but it's like, you know, based on motivation. Something like that is like, I feel like, you know, there's like issues with like the motivation because you can always push back, you know, like your, your theories just by cleaning parameters. I don't know if that satisfies your questions. Well, so we just give up. I mean, we don't give up. We can keep probing down, but uh, you know, there is always a group of people that we always say, "Oh, you don't go down far enough." And the amount of this group of people theoretically will go down as you probe lower and lower. But I'm kind of doubtful. <laughs> well, the same thing happened constant. with the Big Bang. I mean, the world. But to make a gravel star, uh, you need material that has a negative pressure, just like the dark energy or fields of the universe. But you need to excavate it. You can't just, the dark energy is, is uniform. To make a gravel star, you need to sort of sculpt it in a very special way. And why would a star that collapse make substance yeah. such as yeah, that? Exactly, yeah. But uh, the surprising fact is that the Department of Energy is funding uh, <laughs> studies of the dark energy. Yeah. Perhaps someone thinks that we will excavate it one day. Yeah, so this sculpting, you know, like this idea of having this energy, you know, like this, neg you, this negative pressure energy, this is the one that runs afoul of our, uh, you know, energy conditions, and energy conditions are not, it's an axiom. We don't really, you know, I can't really prove it. Well, let's uh, thank Pierre for making